Okay, guys, this is the fourth lecture in the summer assignment, so we're going to get into it here, and we need to get into the language of physics. Like I said before, Newton and Galileo were making all their discoveries, and the math of the time was just not equipped to handle the things they were seeing. So Newton and Leibniz uh, both at the same time were inventing calculus. They both argued over who actually invented it. But calculus is the language of physics. It's the way we understand it, makes our graphs and equations make sense. So in your guided notes, I gave you some space to write whatever you want for what you got out of my beach trip example. I have another example I'll talk through. But my example here is, say I was heading to the beach this summer, and the beach is 200 miles away. So the beach being 200 miles away, if I wanted to get there and have a speed of 60 miles an hour, I would have to get there in three hours. So 200 miles, three hours, I get pulled over. And the cop is starting to write me a ticket for speeding. I said, what do you mean, officer? The speed limit sign here says 60 miles an hour. I am 200 miles from the ocean. It took me exactly three hours to get there. Why am I speeding? And he's saying that that sign is telling me my speed at any moment in time. And that makes so much more sense. The speed limit sign is an instantaneous speed. It wants to know the speed at this moment. I'm so sorry, officer. If I would have known that, I would have never gone faster than 60 miles an hour. I assume that that speed limit said average speed. So it was taking all of my distance divided by all of my time. But those signs, when you see them, are giving you the speed at that moment. So you need to know exactly how far you're going for a very small distance and a very small unit of time. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So derivatives. Derivatives sound like a very uh, terrifying word, but really it's just a fancy name for slope. So when we make graphs in physics, we can have steep slopes, we can have shallow slopes, we can have curved slopes like you see there. But really, when we take the derivative of a function, what we're doing is taking the slope of that line. What I mean by that is, if you look at this steep slope, this is a nice steady steep slope. And over here, this is a shallow slope. So this is a very steady slope as well, another constant slope. But this slope is constantly changing over here on this red graph. So if you look in the beginning, if I take a tiny slope in the beginning, that's very steep. If I take a tiny slope over here, it's starting to level off. And if I take a tiny slope right there, I get no slope. So I've got three different slopes, or de technically three different derivatives, of that same function. And what AP is going to ask of you is just to do six derivatives. So we've got to use things like the chain rule, the power rule, using functions of e to the x, natural log, trig functions. We're going to use a lot more than is covered here on this sheet, but these are the basics that AP wants you to know. So if there's something on here that's confusing, let me know and I'll help you work through it. So the first one we want to go through is the power rule says that if you have a function, you take the power, drop it down in the front, and then subtract the power by 1. This is a shortcut for doing limits. If you're in Calc 1 or you remember in Calc 1, the very first nine weeks you did a bunch of limits, derivatives are the shortcut to doing all those limits. So we're going to do an example here in your guided notes where it says power rule. You can just draw the graphs that I do or follow along. Okay, so if we have a function here that is y equals x cubed, the graph of x cubed is the graph that you're seeing here in the black line. So to take the derivative of this function, what we need to do, if you're just going to do it with the y equals x cubed, is you need to bring the power down in front. So the derivative, which would be written as dy over dx, you would bring that power, that 3 down in front, write x again, 
and then subtract the power by 1 and give you 3x squared. But I would like you to show me some graph proof of this and know where these actually come from. So saying that little quick rule of dropping the 3 down, dropping the power by 1, that is the easiest way to do it. But it has meaning. It came from somewhere. And where it came from is this x cubed graph. So if you look at this x cubed graph, down here in the third quadrant, if I take the slope or the tangent line of this part of the graph, you can see my slope is very positive. And if I take a slope of this curve, that starts to be, it's still positive, but just not as positive. The slope right here at x equals 0 and y equals 0 is technically flat, so it has no slope whatsoever. And over here, positive slope again, and very positive slope again. So if I do that and I plot these five points, positive slope, positive slope, 0, positive slope, positive slope, what I can do is graph that function or graph the derivative. And the derivative would be positive y value, smaller positive y value, a 0, positive y value, and very positive y value. And if I connect all those lines, what you're going to see is a parabola and you get 3x squared. So that's how you take a derivative for the power rule, second derivative of x cubed. So here's my first derivative, 3x squared. The second derivative, you can write that as d squared y over dx squared. That's the fancy way that calculus people like to write that. Another way of writing that is just to do y double prime. So that means you're doing the second derivative of that function you had before. So now I look at my 3x squared, bring that 2 down. So 2 times 3 is going to give me 6x and drop my power by 1. So that's 6x to the first. So a 6x graph is really just a nice straight line. So again, I can take this x cubed function and look at my slopes. My slopes here are very negative. My slope here is still negative. My slope here, zero. My slope here, positive. And my slope here, positive. So if I go to the next page, the second derivative we said was 6x. That was a negative number, a negative number, zero, a positive number, and a positive number. And if I connect those lines, I get a 6x graph, which is a constant slope, 6x, always moving in the positive direction. I can take a third derivative if I want of that x cubed function. That would be taking this derivative. So the third derivative, I'm going to bring that power down. So 6 times 1 is 6. That would be x to the 0 power. But x to the 0 is really just 1. So my next graph, my third derivative, is just 6. And if you look at this graph, this slope is constant the entire time. It's constantly positive. Positive, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So I get a nice steady line at 6 for my third derivative. And if you want to, you can take a fourth derivative. So the fourth derivative, y, 4 prime, would be technically 6x to the 0. I'm going to bring the 0 down and multiply it by 6. And that's actually going to wipe out everything. So the last derivative here is 0. So the fourth derivative of x cubed is a nice solid line at 0. So what I've been doing here is I've been writing out the graph proof of each of these functions. So that's how we use the power rule. Other functions you have here are e to the x functions. So an e to the x is an exponential increase here, as you can see. 
to know the derivative of e to the x, you can just refer back to this chart. Derivative of e to the x actually is e to the x. What I'd like to do is do a graph proof with you. So to do my graph proof of e to the x, and remember, derivatives just mean slopes, so really I'm going to look at slopes of e to the x. So my slope right here, 0. My slope here, starting to increase. My slope here, getting positive, more positive, more positive. So if I plot those points, that's going to give me a 0, starting to become positive, more positive, more positive, and more positive. So technically, if I take the derivative or the slope of an e to the x function, I get e to the x again. It's a very easy derivative to remember. Another function we have is y equals natural log of x. And so the natural log graph looks like this. So with a graph proof, if I take slopes of this location down here, that's extremely positive. I take a slope here. Still positive, not as much. Slope there, still positive, but it's getting smaller. And eventually, it's going to try and level off at zero. So if I plot those four points, I'm going to get a point here. I'm going to get a point here. Even smaller and smaller. Approaching zero, but never touching. So. The derivative is a 1 over x function. So the derivative of natural log is 1 over x. Trig functions are my favorite proofs when doing derivatives. A sine function starts at 0, rises to 1, goes back down to 0, goes to negative 1, and goes back up. So that is what a sine graph looks like. Nice sinusoidal wave. If I want to prove what the derivative of sine is, and you probably haven't memorized from doing calc, the derivative of sine is cosine. And to prove that, we'll do our slopes. The slope here in the beginning is positive. The slope at this peak looks like a flat line. The slope at this is negative. The slope here, zero and the slope there, positive. So I have positive, zero, negative, zero, positive. So if I plot that out, positive, zero, negative, zero, positive. The derivative of sine is cosine. And if you want to take the derivative of cosine, I'll let you do that on your own. Do it, but I'll give you a little hints. Slope, 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 and slope. Yes, you can memorize that sine becomes cosine and cosine becomes something else, but I think the graph proofs are just really cool to see where they actually came from. They come from graphs. They come from taking tiny, tiny slopes of graphs and that's the whole point of doing derivatives. One other rule that we need to look at here is the chain rule. Right here, it's the derivative of f with respect to x, but f depends on u and u depends on x. So what you do is you take two separate derivatives. So the way that AP has it written there, you can do derivative of w with respect to, I don't know, let's call it x, so the derivative of w with respect to x, and you're going to multiply that by the derivative of x with respect to s. So that means that x must equal s squared plus 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of w here with respect to x. So really I could rewrite this as 12x to the fourth plus 7x. And I can do that derivative very, very easily. Bring the 4 down. 4 times 12 is 48. x to the third plus 7. And then I'm going to multiply this function 
by the derivative of x with respect to x. So I'm going to take this and make the derivative, which is going to give me 2s. And the 4 just becomes 0 because it's a constant. So the way to fully write this one is that the derivative of w with respect to s would be 48 s squared plus 4 to the third power plus 7 all multiplied by 2s. And as some of you may realize all I did there really was take the derivative of the inside and multiply by the derivative of the outside. So there's a shorthand way of doing it and there's the longer way that AP has written out how to do that. Example 2 here we have cosine theta cubed and what I want to do is take the derivative of cosine with respect to theta. Now theta is inside that function so I've got to take the derivative of the inside here so that is 3 theta squared but then I'm going to multiply that by the derivative of the outside. The derivative of cosine becomes negative sine and you leave that function alone on the inside. So the derivative using chain rule is take the inside derivative, then multiply by the outside derivative. And that's the quicker, shorter way of doing it. Again, if you need help doing those, please see me and I will assist you on those.